Hi, I'm Sam Coffin with The Human Path at thehumanpath.com. Uh, today's video is about herbal wound healing. What I mean by that is wound healing or you know healing of a laceration or a deep abrasion uh, with the use of herbs. Herbs can, can speed up a, a lot of different stages of wound healing and help us out with things like infection and I want to address that. Now, um, quick disclaimer, this is mainly within the context, of, this video is, is within the context of a post-disaster or remote area, maybe a foreign country remote area, uh, in the middle of the wilderness, uh, her post Hurricane Katrina situation, where you do not have what we would consider higher definitive medical care available. So in other words, there's no operating rooms or emergency rooms or clinics uh, available to you and you are using plant medicine, okay? Now, with that said, I will also tell you that I've used these methods of wound healing and herbs for wound healing for over 20 years, both with myself, with my loved ones. Obviously, as a clinical herbalist, I've used them with, with clients, um, with, with students who have injured themselves in my survival courses. Uh, so, so, again, over two decades of using these methods for wound healing. And so uh, um, I'm not going to tell you that uh, they replace a doctor because they don't, but I will tell you that they are good whether in a remote area or at home uh, for me. Okay, so take that for what it's worth. Now, uh, let's talk briefly, it, rather than getting into the mechanics, I wanted to make a, a, a video on the mechanics of poulticine and, and talk about even burns and things like that, but I thought, well, let's start first with, with wound healing specifically to lacerations and deep abrasions. So, uh, somebody gets cut really badly, uh, they're bleeding, what do you do? Well, the first thing you need to consider is, number one, is it a life-threatening or a limb-threatening uh, laceration? In other words, is there maybe a deep arterial bleed and uh, you have to stop the bleeding first. So if the bleeding is that profound and it's bright red blood and it's pulsing and you know it's an arterial bleed, then your first concern obviously is to stop the bleeding. It's not to, to start applying, uh, you know, to start cleaning out the wound and putting herbs on it. Okay, so assuming that either the bleeding has been stopped and now you're back looking at the tissue to see what, 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 what's going on with it, if there's any infection or, you're, or there might be a, a cause to concern about con infection, um, or it's not that profound of a, of a laceration, as most lacerations aren't, um, you know, encountered day to day. So if that's the case, if it's just um, not bleeding heavily, then the first concern really is to clean that wound out. Right, the solution to pollution is dilution, as the saying goes, and go ahead and apply that. So you're going to clean that wound out uh, with with clean, fresh water or saline solution or other uh, wound cleaning type solutions that you can buy ready made, or you can create your own saline solution if you watch my eye wash video. If you want to go with eye wash, or just you know water, you're drinking water out of your out of your you know canteen or whatever you have there, preferably you know obviously as clean as possible. For an herbal medic, you know clean water is absolutely uh, imperative in everything you do. So water purification is something you need to be aware of and how, that, and how that works and how you can do that. Just as a quick aside. Another thing to bear in mind while we are actually looking at this wound and uh, visualizing it to clean it out is that we're not just cleaning it, but we're also we have to open that wound up and we have to see how deep it is. And we have to, most importantly, see what kinds of tissue may have been cut or affected by that laceration. So, uh, you know, the, the worst case scenario is we're cutting nerves and, 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 and tendons, um, in which case we can also do some tests for that, you know, we can test to see, for instance, if there is a, maybe an extensor tendon that got cut, you know, can they, can they uh, move whatever is distal to that extensor tendon or even what's proximal depending on, on what actually, what the anatomy is of the location of that laceration. We're also looking to make sure there's no nerve damage, so we'd be testing to make sure that they have, uh, that they're able to feel um, in, in the distal perhaps to that laceration. Um, so this tells us a lot about um, how we're going to proceed because we're not just talking about herbs to just close up every wound. And we can't necessarily, if for instance we had a full tendon cut, there's nothing we're going to do with an herb to be able to heal that. You know, that's going to have to require some kind of, of um, surgical intervention. We have to actually sew those two ends of that tendon together. You've cleaned the wound out and now we can look at applying herbs. And, and so I want to go through the four stages of wound healing and talk about the different wounds, or different, I'm sorry, different herbs in each of those stages that can work. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm giving you some herbs. I want to make sure that you go away from this video with about 10 herbs or so uh, that, that, that are maybe new herbs for you, maybe not, but that you can apply. But, but bear in mind that these herbs actually, um, they, they are, go across, they're, they're not just herbs for only one stage of wound healing. And I'll talk about that as I get to that, okay? Um, 
So arguably the first stage of wound healing is the hemostatic phase or the, you know, your blood clotting basically, the stopping, the, the bleeding stopping. Now um, some will say that's not actually a stage of wound healing. Um, I, I, I disagree. So that's what I'm going to say is it's the first stage of wound healing. So the hemostatic phase, what kinds of herbs you, help you with the uh, stopping a bleed? And for that any astringent herb will work. There's tons of astringent herbs out there. Okay, bilberry, wild geranium root, uh, you know, uh, you could go uva ursi, you could go on and on and on with astringent herbs. Astringent herbs generally always will help stop bleeding. They will also generally help stop diarrhea uh, inter if taken internally. So the three that I'm going to give you for this will be yarrow, which is very well known as an astringent, you know, what we call a styptic herb uh, to help stop bleeding. Uh, there's um, some say, or I've heard, I've heard, you know, kind of hearsay. I don't, I don't know if I've read it or, or not. That certain Indian tribes would not um, go to battle. They'd pick their battlegrounds based upon where there were fields of yarrow around, so that they knew they could use those to, to help heal the wounds afterwards. So yarrow is an extremely good styptic. Um, it's good for other things as well, but it's a very good styptic. Um, also, oak, oak bark is very, very styptic. It's very high in tannic acid, but it's very highly astringent. Um, also, shepherd's purse is a very good astringent herb applied externally. Um, it's one that's used by midwives a lot for, for women, postpartum care. Uh, so, uh, those are our three hemostatic herbs. And how they can be applied, again, I'm going to get into the mechanics of an actual, um, get into the mechanics of an actual, uh, uh, um, how you apply a, um, a poultice in another video, but um, Bear in mind, I'm not talking about using these herbs as a, a type of um, clotting powder that you just throw into the, to the wound. Um, although I have actually done that before with myself, uh, but, but it's not something I recommend at all. You want to try to keep all of that foreign matter out of the wound. However, what you can do instead, what you want is you want that, the, um, the, the fluid from the herb to drip into the wound and around the wound and into that tissue very much the same way that a tea bag you know drips uh, you know the the herb contents into a hot cup of, of, of water for you so the idea is to be able to make a poultice is to um, actually get the contents or the constituents of that herb into the tissue without getting the uh, the actual matter the herb matter itself into that cut or into that wound okay um, so the, the hemostatic phase, you know, if we wanted to, we could put some of those hemostatic herbs into a poultice and wrap it on top of, of that wound in either a compression bandage if we really needed it, or just put it on top there to help the, help the bleeding stop, stop or slow down, um, or we could even hold them on with our hand. Um, some people talk about using a spit poultice, which is also called a bolus, where they chew up an herb and then put it on the wound. Um, frankly, I think that's, I, I don't recommend that. Uh, I don't care what people say, and there's all kinds of um, kind of urban legend stuff urban legend about the fact that um, uh, well it's your saliva is your own your own body fluid and it, it actually helps the wound heal the, the human mouth is filthy full of bacteria it's probably it's possibly one of the filthiest mammals mouths on, on the planet and I just you know I, I honestly say that if you're going to use uh, just the raw herb which I do that a lot use the raw herb generally the raw herbs that work really well have a lot of moisture in them and just taking that that herb itself and squeezing it and putting it directly on the wound um, is enough there's enough moisture in there that it starts dripping I'm not saying put it inside the wound but just on top of the wound and you can even tape it on top or band-aid it on top or whatever there are many herbs that are good for that too um, again I'm trying to stick with herbs that are uh, kind of uh, across the, across the, the board they are they are uh, herbs that you can get uh, either online or in herb stores that is pretty much anywhere in the United States. I'm, I'm trying not, not to give you herbs that are specific to Central Texas or the Southwest that you'd have to go out and, and identify the herb uh, because this isn't directed towards that really uh, that type of audience. This, that's not the purpose of this video. Um, okay, so let's move on to the second phase of wound healing and that is called inflammation or the inflammation stage. So at this point, if you can imagine, uh, what's happened prior to the inflammation stage during the hemostatic phase is what we would call vasoconstriction. That is the tightening of all the blood vessels. Now in the inflammation stage, the, actually the opposite happens and our, our, we have what, was called, what would be called peripheral vasodilation. And so we have blood vessels actually opening and becoming more permeable. And so uh, what happens is cells, our, our white blood cells, like um, 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 neutrophils and macrophages, blood cells that, that, that defend our body, that are part of our immune system, are able to move through that perme more permeable vascular tissue and move into the area of the wound itself. So that when we had foreign matter, uh, even if you thought you cleaned it out, of course, microscopically, there's bacteria in there. There's all kinds of foreign matter in there. And so what has to happen is um, 
our, our own uh, immune system, our white blood cells, have to uh, deal with that. So that inflammation stage is actually very important for the healing process. You have to have that. So just because of the fact that your wound is swelling and may look a little bit red right after you, you know, for, for the first few hours after you've, you've cut yourself, it's not a bad thing. It's actually a good thing. You want that inflammation, that initial inflammation. However, you don't want that inflammation to last too long because it can actually, if it, if it does, then it, then it can be counterproductive to the tissue, actually the next stage of, of wound healing and how the tissue actually comes together also. So one of the things that I wanted to talk about is actually a very important concept in wound healing, especially with herbs, and that is tissue state. Now I talked briefly about, if you watch the, um, the uh, eye wash video, then you probably heard me talk about tissue type. And I briefly mentioned tissue state. Well, in wound healing, we already know that, you know, we can talk a little bit about the tissue type. We're generally talking about the epithelium of our outer skin and, uh, and then the, the layers within that um, that we're trying to work with, or depending on how deep the cut is, of course. Uh, but one thing that's very important is tissue state and how, uh, how we uh, maintain a good tissue, a good viable tissue state for that tissue to, to ultimately to heal in the quickest possible manner. Okay. Um, now, what we're, what we're not going to do is we're not going to pull those, those sides of the wound together in a remote or a post-disaster situation and try to put sutures in it. That's absolutely irresponsible. We are instead going to leave that wound open and yet we can still close it using, uh, using compression bandages, using, using poultices. We can close the edges so that we don't have a huge open scar and granulation tissue forming in there. Uh, we want to try to get the tissues lined up, but we want to have a gap in there for, for the possibility or for infection to drain because there's always going to be some amount of infection no matter how careful we are. We're going to have something there. So, um, the tissue state itself the reason I brought that up, the infection and, and bringing the wound uh, tissue together, is that tissue state allows us to see um, how that wound is healing and how, if those edges are being brought together, how they fit together. And so what I mean by tissue state is we don't want it to be too wet, we don't want it to be too dry, we don't want it to be too hot, we don't want it to be too cold. Um, these are getting into sort of energetic concepts too, but, but these are very applicable and physiological and visible um, tissue states that you can see for your own eyes. You can see when you're wet, when your wound becomes too boggy or wet. You can see when it starts to dry out on the edges. You don't want that. So the herbs help us keep that. And so inflammation, when we're dealing with the inflammation stage, as we get back to that concept, um, we want herbs that are not going to necessarily you know, end the inflammation. And none of them really are. They're not going to just stop the inflammation. We don't want them to necessarily vasoconstrict all of the cellular tissues and, 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 and not allow any of that inflammation to continue. But rather, we want them to be what we would call more of a gentle, more vulnerary, um, and also something to help um, increase the micro, uh, the, the macrophage or the, the, uh, the microbial or our, our white blood cell a microbial eating activity that's going on around that wound. And so the three herbs that I'm going to tell you for the, uh, the inflammation phase that are, that are very useful would be plantain and echinacea and uh, ladies mantle. Now, um, they're, they're useful for, for different reasons, really. The plantain is a, is a vulnerable of sorts and it helps the skin tissue heal. And it's got many different aspects to it that are very important. It's also antimicrobial, not necessarily directly antimicrobial, although it is to some extent, but also it has um, certain constituents to it that break down bacteria's ability to defend itself. Um, and, and I'm not going to get into that here. It's way too, way too much depth for, this, for what is supposed to be a short video, I hope. Um, but uh, plantain is, is very useful uh, in the inflammation stage because of that. Echinacea is also a soothing, uh, cooling type of herb uh, and, and is, is um, also somewhat moistening in its energetics as well, uh, which we want. We want to keep that, you know, we want to keep the, the skin not too wet, but we do want to keep that tissue moist. And also echinacea helps uh, stimulate macrophage activity as well, and that's, that's what we're trying to do in the area. Now, Echinacea augustifolia is my preference if you have to choose, um, or at least Echinacea augustifolia mixed in with um, other types of Echinacea. There's, there's several different species of Echinacea. There's purpurea, there's palita, there's uh, uh, sanguinaria. Um, they are not all the same. I don't care what anybody else tells you, they aren't all the same. Um, so, to bear that in mind. Um, ladies mantle also very good. It's, now, ladies mantle is probably the most astringent of those three, but it's also very good tissue uh, moderation mo moderator in terms of uh, keeping that tissue state where we want it to be during the inflammation. So now we need to start thinking about 
inflammation versus infection. So uh, let me, before I get to that, let me briefly say that there's a timeline along all of these stages of, in, of wound healing, of course, and, and I uh, will probably have some text up there that shows you the four stages right off the bat. So let me just briefly say that the timeline for, for instance, the hemostatic phase is, is anywhere from, from seconds to minutes, hopefully not too much longer than minutes. You don't want a wound that's obviously bleeding for 30 minutes or an hour. Um, but you know, within minutes, the hemostatic phase is usually finished. And at that point, the, the inflammation stage, excuse me, the inflammation stage will then, will then be in process. So from, from minutes to hours to even the, the first few days, three or four days, you might have inflammation depending again on the wound depth, on your own immune system and, and your health, etc. cetera. Um, during that period of time, within a matter of hours, Today's is also when you're going to find that there is, uh, you know, that, that if you're going to get an infection, usually that's when the propensity for infection is the greatest because you've just had the foreign matter introduced into your body and assuming that you've kept it clean after that, you know, if you've kept it bandaged, you've kept it wrapped, this is very important in a remote area or in a remote or in a post disaster situation, you have to keep that wound wrapped, you have to keep it covered. It's very, very important. But um, assuming that you've done that, um, you know, you're, gonna, you're talking about hours to days to where you start to see the first signs of infection. Um, now, they are not all that easy to distinguish necessarily from the initial inflammation because when you get inflammation in the inflammation stage, you're going to have um, redness of the tissue to some degree, you're going to have a little bit of swelling, it's going to be painful, you're going to have pain just because the tissue is swelling, it's going to be painful. So how does that differ from, the, uh, from infection, from being able to, tell, to, being able to discern infection? Well, uh, infection will give you uh, the same thing, will give you, of course, redness, it will give you also heat, uh, and it will give you uh, pain, but the pain generally is more, especially as the infection starts to grow, so over a matter of a few days, uh, the pain will be a little more um, uh, regional than just, just, that, just local to that particular uh, injury. So in other words, it might spread, the pain might spread a little bit, the pain might uh, um, be more apparent if it's been if you've been sitting still for a while and then you start to move and and there's suddenly you know sharper pain in the in the area around it and then of course there's also systemic signs of infection uh, such as you know fever and chills and that type of thing that would come a little later than that that would definitely be your first uh, would be uh, warning signs that this was actually there was an infection taking place yeah and that's a whole nother video um, if I want to keep this video under about three hours and I'd like to keep it under about 30 minutes then I can't I'm not going to get into that but there are different types of infections there are different uh, ways that we would deal with different types of infections um, but to begin with well, let's just talk about specifically from a laceration standpoint what are some of the good basic antimicrobials um, and there are some really good ones out there one of the ones I like to use is myrrh um, another one that's really good is neem leaf so the myrrh we're using it's a, it's a we're using the gum of that tree um, neem the leaf uh, and these are both non um, North American um, herbs, I understand that, but they are again, they're available, they're generally and generically available. I actually grow neem tree myself here in South Texas and it does very well. I have to, I have to keep it potted but, uh, and take it in during the coldest months, but it does very well uh, during the summer here and I harvest all my neem freshly that way. Um, also uh, Baptisia, or, or, uh, which is a very, um, also called wild indigo and is a very, um, very good anti-infective as well. Um, antimicrobial. Now I mentioned earlier uh, echinacea. Echinacea is also in its own right a certain type of antimicrobial um, in a sense that it stimulates the immune system. Um, I contend that it also is directly antimicrobial in, in my experience. Um, there are many others though. Golden seal probably a lot of people are, are familiar with. Um, uh, we have uh, uh, several other types of antimicrobials for different types of infections. Usnea thallus is, a, you know, is one that people, pe some people talk about a lot for gram-positive bacteria, for instance. Um, but just to take with you at least these three particular three herbs uh, for the, for the uh, antimicrobial, which is again kind of going hand in hand possibly with that inflammation stage. Okay? The final stage of wound healing is called the proliferation stage. I'm sorry, it's not the final, it's the second to last. Uh, uh, but, but it's the final one that we're going to really talk about in depth here. And the final stage is called the proliferation stage because that is the point where um, you now have different types of cells that come together to be able to grow that tissue back together. So um, what happens if you don't stitch the wound together, stitch those, those uh, edges of the wound together, is you have what's called granulation healing. So you have granulation tissue that forms in that gap between the wounds. Now, we don't want that to be a big, we don't want to have a big, huge uh, granulation gap there. That's going to cause a whole bunch of scar tissue. Scar tissue is not what we want, both from a cosmetic standpoint, but more importantly, from just a long-term health standpoint. 
when you have huge scars or scars like that, that becomes very weakened tissue. There's very little circulation to that area, which means it's also prone to, to follow on infections. I don't know how many times I've treated cellulitis in the field and it's been, it's, it's, it's over somebody's scar tissue. There's an old scar on the leg or an old scar on the arm or something and they get a scratch or, or whatever and there's a little bit of infective tissue, or I'm sorry, infective matter, uh, a microbial um, infection that gets into any of that scar tissue or around that scar tissue and there's just not enough blood circulation to keep that area cleaned out and to, you know, to do the things that our body does to prevent infection. So scar tissue is very weak tissue. Plus, it's also weak physically. I mean, it actually has a has a uh, physio, f physical weakness to it in that it can split and open up very easily. Again, you get like fighters, for instance, they get hit and have the same you know spots hit in their body or their you know their, their eyebrows or their face or whatever that have opened up several times, and they just get touched in that area and that, that area opens up even if it seems to be healed. So scar tissue is not necessarily, of course, is not what we want, but the types of cells that are going to cause that growth to happen that is not, that, that is what we would consider uh, scar tissue and the way that the, the tissue is growing back together as quickly as possible, that is something we do want. We do want to um, encourage the proliferation of new tissue in that area. So to do that, there are some very good, there are some extremely good herbs for that phase as well. Um, and those three herbs are sh that I'm going to talk about uh, in, in this video are chaparral and comfrey and calendula. Now, um, again, I told you earlier at the very beginning of this video that, that I'm giving you about nine or ten herbs or whatever to um, to go through or to, to take with you from this video, and that those vi those herbs actually span across these different phases. And this is where I would tell you that there are certain herbs that you could literally use for every single phase of this uh, of healing here. One of those herbs is chaparral. Chaparral is good through all four uh, of the of the different phases that we've talked about here. Um, well, the three phases plus the antimicrobial or the, or the infection uh, possibilities. So it's a great hemostatic. It's good for the inflammation phase um, as an anti-inflammatory, in, in tissue anti-inflammatory. It is very, very good antimicrobial and is profound as a tissue uh, regenerator, as a proliferator. Um, it is absolutely profound. I cut myself once. It's, I told you earlier in this video that I'd, I would never recommend putting the actual matter, you know, the herb matter into the wound or the laceration itself. But very early in my starting an interest in herbs, um, I had a bunch of chaparral that was finely powdered and I cut myself very deeply and I um, basically put it on, on my hand. It was, a saw, it was a saw cut too, so it was kind of an ugly, ugly, ugly cut uh, down into muscle tissue even. Fortunately, no tendons. And I um, put uh, chaparral directly in that. I um, uh, packed it and I taped it. And the next morning, my the wound had literally just kind of uh, ex excreted out all of that chaparral into kind of a big uh, black, uh, you know, blood and chaparral type of scab on the front on the surface of the wound. And so I washed very carefully. I, I dabbed away the chaparral, and the tissue had just perfectly lined up and perfectly formed. And to this day, I mean, I don't have any scar there at all. It was, you know, of course I wrapped it and I took very good care care of it. It was very delicate, but it healed very quickly. And then after that, I put a, a chaparral poultice on the top of that and just let the, you know, as I talked about earlier, let that let the constituents um, soak down through that tissue. But I didn't, you know, obviously not. It was closed. I didn't want to put anything back inside it, and I shouldn't have really put that inside it in the first place. Um, but you know, I was brand new to the whole concept of, of herbs, and I was absolutely amazed at how well that worked. Um, so uh, proliferation, um, chaparral is okay all the way through that, and and uh, comfrey is very good as a, as a tissue proliferator as well. However, the downside to comfrey is it really doesn't have any antimicrobial type activity to it, and and calendula to some degree doesn't either. It's just, and as calendula. It has some, but it's certainly not nearly as, as what I would call antimicrobial on that uh, spectrum as uh, chaparral is. So the danger is if you put a t tissue proliferator too quickly on a, an open laceration is that it's going to close up from the bottom up very quickly and you're going to end up trapping uh, and, you know, bacteria or other types of microbes in there and you're going to end up with a, an infection, a deep infection. Uh, they, they could even become very bad, you know, like an anaerobic infection like gangrene if, you, if it was sitting in there. So it's very important that you allow that tissue to drain and you don't just throw a cell, uh, you know, proliferant on there right off the bat, unless it's a good proliferant that has a lot of antimicrobial uh, herbs in with it. Okay, so you could make a formula, for instance, I make a wound powder where I've got chaparral, I don't have any comfrey and I don't have any calendula in that uh, because it's, it's really for the first um, few hours, first few days that I use that. 
and uh, but it does have a lot of chaparral. So the final phase is called the remodeling phase, which can start anywhere from three weeks to three months out and last up to a year, you know, several months to a year. And this is where your body is trying to restructure that, um, that scar tissue. And, uh, you know, as we talked about, scar tissue is bad. We don't want to have that scar tissue as our final result. Um, and the body knows that too, of course, and tries to get the tissue back to as close to the same structure of tissue as it was prior to the laceration or the wound. I wasn't going to get too much in depth on the, on the remodeling phase at all, um, you know, because by that point, you're out of danger. You've, you know, your wound, you're, you are now have healed up the skin. You're able to, to function, you know, whether we're talking about a remote or a post-disaster situation or even at home. Uh, but, but certainly there are things we can use. And again, um, one of the herbs that works really well for that is comfrey. Um, and another um, uh, vitamin, vitamin E uh, oil, is very good as well to be uh, rubbed in and soften up that tissue. The main thing we're trying to do is to break down that scar tissue, soften it up, and allow uh, circulation into there and allow that, allow that tissue change to actually happen. Um, but that, that wasn't my intent to really get too far into remodeling at all during this video. Um, my, my main intent was really to get up through proliferative phase of wound healing. So I did, and I uh, hope you enjoyed the video. If you have any questions, you can always email me, uh, info at thehumanpath.com, or you can, you can post on the YouTube, and I'll always get back to you. Thanks for watching.